The Week in Bible Prophecy, a Prophecy Watchers podcast. Welcome to the podcast today, everybody. We have got a tremendous program. I am sitting here with Chris Pinto. Welcome, Chris. Great to be here, Mondo. Good to see you again. And uh, I had an opportunity to uh, watch, I've seen many of your films, but I had an opportunity lately to watch your latest film on the Jesuits. Now, we're going to get into that in a minute, but I do want to remind everybody about our upcoming conference in Branson, Missouri, December 5th through 8th. And we already have, man, we already have over a thousand people signed up. It's going to be a great time. Uh, We're calling it Christmas in Branson. And so uh, we got 20 speakers there at least 20 speakers. So join us. If you can't join us uh, live, then maybe you can join us through live stream, uh, prophecywatchers.com. Check it out. Again, it's going to be a good time. Uh, I find it interesting too that um, it'll be a very interesting conference because it's only a a, a few short weeks after the election. Mm. And uh, so things will be very interesting. I mean, we know, we always say that, uh, this election is is the most important in, 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 you know, whatever. But it seems like over the past few, it has been true. Every time the next one is even more important than the previous. Uh, because we're watching the end of the age. We're watching the signs and we're watching the setup happen uh, with globalism and a whole bunch of other things. So this is pretty amazing. But uh, one of the things that this is a good segue here um, is this this idea of of people working behind the scenes to set up a an antichrist order. We'll get into that, but uh, Chris, just you know, for our audience who might not know you, kind of introduce yourself to them, who you are, you know, what you've been doing, and 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 the different films, and and really uh, take some time here because you have so many great films out there, which I would love for people to uh, to learn about and and to be intrigued about. Well, I'm Chris Pinto, uh, and our ministry is called Adullam Films, and it's named after the Cave Adullam in the Old Testament, which is the cave that David fled to when he was being persecuted by King Saul. And there all the outcasts of Israel gathered around him. He became their leader. And we think that's a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then David goes out fighting against the enemies of Israel. And for me, that's a picture of how we're called to fight the good fight of faith. And we do that through our work in film and video production. And also through our podcast at noiseofthunderradio.com. But like you said, we've, you know, my focus in terms of being an independent Christian filmmaker has been in contending for the faith against the the corrupt influences of the powers of darkness, if you will. You know, Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. And so that's what a lot of our, our, our work is focused on, and exposing it yeah. from the Bible, also from history, and then by examining world events, you know, what's happening in the world today. Uh, we have one of our early series called uh, Secret Mysteries of America's Beginnings, Part 1, The New Atlantis. The New Atlantis, many people are not aware, is one of the names for what people today are calling the New World Order. Okay or the Great Reset. It's all the same thing. It's just repackaged in different labels and exactly. terms. Yeah. Exactly. And there, we, in that film, we talk about Sir Francis Bacon and how he was the first Grand Master of modern masonry. Uh, and then he became the chief of the Rosicrucians. Rosicrucianism, which is very deceptive because the symbolism is the rose and the cross. And so the rose symbolizes paganism and the mystery religion. Mm-hmm. Okay, so sub rows of the idea of secrecy, and then the cross, of course, Christianity. But it's, if you combine it, it's like the secret Christianity. That's what they're communicating. And it has to do with these secret groups, these secret societies. What, what, what are some of those? Well, you got the Freemasons, you have the Rosicrucians, you have the Skull and Bone Society, you have the Hellfire Clubs throughout uh, Europe that were active for centuries, a modern day Hellfire Club would be at the Bohemian Grove in Northern California, which is very well documented, that we have uh, political leaders that go out there and they're involved in these pagan occult rituals that ought to be disturbing for everyone. Now, sometimes, you know, we've had people who are Christian who, who question whether or not we should be focusing on things like that. And what I do is I always go to the scripture and I point out to people that we're warned about this over and over again throughout the Word of God. 
And you were mentioning before we started uh, Ezekiel chapter 8, how God takes Ezekiel and he shows him through a, a hole in the wall in the temple that all the ancient men are there worshiping all the pagan gods and Inside goddesses. the temple. Inside the temple of God. Uh, here's a scripture I want to read from 2 Kings 17 and verse 9, where it says, And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fence cities. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. I believe that's why they call the Bohemian Grove the grove. Mm -hmm. It's a reference to this paganism from the Old Testament. And it says, uh, and there they burn incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them. And they wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger, for they served idols, whereof the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this thing. So the Lord said to them, you shall not do this thing. And yet that's what they were doing. And they knew that the laws of God condemned this behavior. And that if you tried to draw somebody away from the Lord, you could even be put to death oh, absolutely, yeah. under the Old Testament law. Uh, and yet, so that's why they're doing it secretly. They're doing it secretly. Secret societies are secret because they know that they're part of some evil, wicked, subterranean behavior, and they don't want everybody else to find out about it. That's why they keep it secret. And uh, it, we talk about it, but we talk about it in a very historic way where we go and we go on location to different places. And we talk about it from the historic perspective because a lot of it is interwoven in ancient churches. Like you go to a temple church in London. We took a trip there at one point. And you look at the confessionals and in the confessionals they have these roses wow. that are engraved in the archway of the confessional. And it's this whole idea of being sub rosa, secret. That what's talked about in the confessional is not going to be talked about anywhere else. And we cover all that in the New Atlantis. Um, part two in that series is called Riddles in Stone, where we go over the secret architecture in Washington, D.C. We talk about the symbolism of the pentagram. A lot of people, you know, at first people are thinking, well, you're trying to say that there's some deep, dark Satanism involved, which it can be that, but not necessarily. A lot of it is interwoven in what they call the ancient mysteries or the, the wisdom tradition. That's another term that they use in these groups. And so the whole idea of the pentagram, for example, was based on the rotation of Venus around the sun uh, and how Venus over an eight-year cycle goes around the sun and forms a five-pointed star. That's where they took the idea from. Now, in Washington, D.C., you have, because people point out the, uh, and we explain all this in the film, <laughs> in Washington, D.C., you have a pentagram in the street design of Washington, D.C., but people say, well, wait a minute, it's an incomplete pentagram because the last part of it comes down and it stops short. And so they say, well, that means it's not really a pentagram. And what we show is that the idea of a broken pentagram is actually a pagan symbol, well known. We quote Manly P. Hall and other sources. And then we show that the reason for it is because this rotation of Venus around the sun stops short in the, at the end of its cycle. And so it does not form a complete pentagram. And so the ancients, that's why they use the open or broken pentagram. So those kind of details. But once you understand it that way and you understand that this was, you know, the Pythagoreans, they thought the pentagram, they called it the pentangle or the pent alpha. Uh, they thought it was very symbolic and they had all these philosophic traditions that they developed from it. But that's what paganism and the occult really is. The word occult simply means that which is hidden. And when we read the New Testament and we read what the Apostle Paul is saying, he's saying to the church at one point, I tell you that the sacrifice which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. Well, who are these demons? Zeus, Apollo, yep. Athena. The, the, we, we've, been, we've been conditioned, I think, in modern times to think these are just harmless, you know, just, just fake names. Yeah. I mean, no, there's real beings behind these names. Yeah. In fact, the temple of Zeus in the ancient world 
in uh, Revelation where uh, Jesus says, I know where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. Mm -hmm. He's talking to the church at Pergamum. Mm -hmm. That's where they had the temple of Zeus. And that's believed to have been the seat of Satan mm -hmm. at that time. In fact, the image, now this gets really powerful, Mondo. I want to I share this because this is where Freemasonry and the Jesuits and their, and, and all really all these secret groups, they all practice what are called the ancient mystery religion, mm -hmm. which is the idea that really blending all the gods and goddesses into one, once you understand it. But the way they do it is you read Albert Pike and his book, Morals and Dogma, and he mentions the ancient Egyptian god, Amon, Amon of Mendes. And Amon was this ram-headed or goat-headed god. And it was, Pike says, that the secret of Amon is that he was the spirit of the gods and that all the other gods were various representations of him. So what they did was, you had the Greeks, they took their god uh, Zeus, and they said, well, Amon, he must be the, the soul or the spirit of Zeus. So they took the ram horns from Amon, and they put them on the bearded figure of Zeus, and you end up with this bearded guy with horns coming out of his head. In fact, you can look up online, if you look up Zeus Amon, you'll find bearded figures with horns coming out of their head. Alexander the Great believed he was the son of Zeus Amon. That's why you have a coin of Alexander with a, a ram's horn coming out of his head. So that's where this whole idea, but see the early church recognized that this was Satanism. This was Satan's religion. This blending together of all the gods. So we believe it's very important to understand what these groups are doing because people are not just waking up, Mondo, and suddenly they're promoting transgenderism and open borders and all these different things. These things are being talked about by people who are involved in these groups and then they're unleashing them into our system. You know, everything you just said is so interesting in that it's almost like the all these things that have been there and that they've been secret. Some of them, it seems now, are just right out in the open in, in our current, uh, like in the last five, ten years. All those ancient gods, it seems to be that, that even though they've kind of been in the shadows now, when you look at all the... The, the trans the trans stuff that you know the, the the gender confusion you know the, the wokeness social justice all these other things these subvers subversive things that have been happening for a long time are now just come becoming mainstream in our in our current culture well it uh, uh, relating it to the bible we we both know the history of what happened in the days of king ahab and queen jezebel mm -hmm. that they both worship baal uh that the scripture says that when ahab worshiped baal it says, as though it were a light thing, mm -hmm. that he would worship Baal. Uh, and so that's what King Ahab does. But how did they get there? I believe the way that they got there was it began with these secret groups. They're practicing this paganism in hideaway places. And then eventually it manifests itself in the government. And that becomes like the new normal. Yeah, the new normal. That's a good you know? to say. And, yeah. and that's exactly what Ahab and Jezebel did. They made Baal worship the new normal. They started persecuting the true prophets of God, and then now it's the prophets of Baal who are sitting at Jezebel's table. Yeah, yeah. And then we, we see the big uh, the big battle in 1 Kings 18 uh, with Elijah. I mean, it, I mean, here we are. So, I mean, it, it, this is probably a good time to segue because in, in thinking about, um, you know, these secret groups, you mentioned it earlier, and I mentioned it in the sense that your new documentary, Kind of introduce us to that the new documentary and and why you why you why you ended up with this with this topic because this is this is going to be an interesting topic because you know we always have a variety of people you know people who are Catholic or whatever um, I was raised Catholic so I'm I'm not a I'm not a, a novice in understanding Catholicism I went to Catholic grade school was an altar boy all those things our priests were Jesuits at, at there so maybe kind of introduce that in 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 the sense of again this 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 idea behind what many of them are doing in their history. And again, that doesn't mean just because I'm sitting there as a 10 year old in my local parish and I don't see any of this doesn't mean that it's not going on. Right. So talk about that. 
Well, the film is called American Jesuits, A History of Jesuitism in the, in the United States. And we, we go over the history of the order, why they were formed. You yeah, the great Protestant Reformation that happened where the reformers recover the Bible. The Bible had been outlawed. And uh, why? Because people kept preaching the Bible and they were opposing the Pope. And the popes got angry, so they outlawed the Bible in the 13th century. Uh, and that's, that remained for a time uh, until you had people like John Wycliffe. Wycliffe translated his Bible uh, because he believed that people had a right to have access to the Word of God in their own language. That was the, the great drive there. Uh, but, for, but for Rome, the issue was their own authority and the authority of the Pope. So the Reformation happens, people start reading the Bible and they're turning away from Rome. Well, after this went on for a few decades, the Pope launched what is called the Counter-Reformation, Pope Paul III. And he commissioned a Spanish soldier who became a priest named Ignatius Loyola. And Loyola founded this company, it was called the Company of Jesus. Uh, the Society of Jesus is their official name but they became known as Jesuits, that's really a, um, a negative term. It, it means somebody who claims to believe in Jesus, but they're just using the name of Jesus as a pretense for their corrupt practices. The Jesuits have been repeatedly called the fulfillment of all the warnings about wolves in sheep's clothing, that that is who and what they are. Um, and there's just many, many writers throughout history who have effectively said the same thing. And we go over a whole list of them, whether it's historians like J.A. Wiley or former U.S. presidents like uh, John Adams, uh, whether it's uh, uh, great men of history like Otto von Bismarck, the great chancellor of Germany, who expelled the Jesuits back in the 19th century. So there's a whole history of the order that used to be very, very well known. In fact, if you got a Webster's Dictionary from the 1850s and 60s, uh, and you looked up the word Jesuit or Jesuitical, it was always, the Jesuits were always mentioned in the negative as deceivers who, who crafted deceptions as part of a secret agenda. You know, and that doesn't, I, I think about that, uh, again, I think about the ignorance of, of the modern culture. E, e, again, even myself, in the sense of living in, the, in an environment where, oh yeah, you know, Jesuits was just something common. We, and there was Jesuit schools, you know, that we would, f from our school, we would filter into a Jesuit school uh, for high school if I was to go there. And I actually was, was, was making my way to go to one. It never happened. But you don't think in those terms, but to, to have it where it, it makes its way into a dictionary, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen overnight by any yeah. means as it relates to, um, you know, having a connotation like that. Yeah, and, and, and I, I should say this, because you and I were talking about it earlier, and, and you had Jesuits who taught you when you were in school. Mm -hmm. Are all Jesuits necessarily bad or part of some nefarious plot? I'm inclined not to think so, because there are different levels to the order. Mm -hmm. And you have people like Malachi Martin, mm -hmm. who was a Jesuit, and he left the order at some point. He because, was exposing it, too. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. He wrote a bunch of books exposing it. In the 1800s, you had um, a very prominent Catholic guy named uh, uh, Paul von Hohensbruck, who came from a noble German Catholic family, and he, he really loved his parents. You read his writings, and he talks about his upbringing and how wonderful his parents were to him. So when he became a young man, he became a Jesuit, and he was a Jesuit for 14 years, but then he left the order, he said, because he discovered that the Jesuits were behind socialism in Germany, okay? And then he became a Protestant, wrote all of these different books, and he was trying to warn Catholics and Protestants about what they were doing. So obviously, I think von Hohensbruck was sincere. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, was a, he thought he was following the one true faith, and once he realized that there was corruption there that was just part of their way of doing things. He didn't want to be a part of it. He left and uh, tried to warn others. Uh, we talked uh, before the break about uh, uh, Lord Acton in England, who famously said, he was a Catholic statesman, but he famously said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. 
and he was warning about the totalitarian claims made by the popes and the Jesuit order. So I think there are people in the Catholic system who are sincere and who are trying to do the right thing. That's what I mean by all that. Yeah. I found it very interesting that even the way that you started your documentary, which again, this documentary is absolutely tremendous. You know, it's almost three hours of material. I, I was shocked. I'm a researcher and I was shocked at how you found so many uh, original uh, sources and everything else. And the way that you opened the film was just talking about the, the, the foundation of America. And yet even at that early stage, it, the so 1540 roughly Ignatius of Loyola you know the the, the Jesuits are founded so a hundred years later you know in the early days of of the uh, the Plymouth Brethren and etc and yet there even within a hundred years they recognize the threat talk talk about that I mean how, how you how you started the film so we show we show one of the early ships that the, the Puritans sailing to America and it's with Governor John Winthrop. And uh, Governor Winthrop is famous for having, you know, for, for the, the quote about America being as a city on a hill. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he, he's the one who originally gave that speech. You know, we shall be as a city on a hill. Uh, but he said it, the full speech, he says, we shall be as a city on a hill so that if we shall deal falsely with our God mm -hmm. in this work that he has prepared for us, we shall become as a proverb and a byword to the world. So it was actually, on the one hand, a, a beautiful concept. On the other hand, a warning. You know, that if we're faithful to God, we'll be a shining city. If we're not, then we could be brought to ruin. So, and of course, that's the warning that God gave to ancient Israel. But uh, Governor Winthrop gave as the number one reason for the Puritan migration to America... He said to preach the gospel in those parts and to raise up a bulwark against the kingdom of Antichrist that the Jesuits labor to rear up in those parts. So th this is, this is, you're not uh, giving the sense of what he said. You're quoting him exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So he, he specifically mentions the Jesuits and, and that America should be founded as a bulwark against the powers of Antichrist, but in particular the Jesuits as an antichrist system. So talk as well, because about, so this is 1640, you know, roughly there. And, and we know that, of course, the colonies began to develop as there was more migration coming across. But yet many of them, or at least that there was, to talk about from there all the way to the revolution, how there was a consistency and even a banning of Jesuits altogether in some places. Oh yeah, Massachusetts Bay specifically. In fact, they, they, uh, the state of Massachusetts to this day has on their website, you know, talking about when they banned the Jesuit order from the Massachusetts Bay uh, colony. Yes, they, they officially banned them, forbade them from setting foot. Not in, even allowed. Yep. Not even allowed. Uh, a lot of it had to do at that point, that would have been uh, 1630, I think, is when the Puritans came in. But you had the gunpowder plot of 1605, which was blamed on the Jesuit order. That, wow. that, in fact, a lot of people don't realize, you know, people are running around wearing the Guy Fawkes mask from V for Vendetta, mm -hmm. the movie. Well, Guy Fawkes was a Jesuit agent. He was, it was the Jesuits who put him up to putting the barrels of gunpowder beneath the Houses of Parliament there. They were going to blow it to smithereens and kill the Protestant King James and put a stop to the development of the King James translation. Uh, and then they were going to usher in a, a Catholic government to take over. But the whole thing was exposed and brought to an end. In fact, one of the, uh, you know, there's the poem, Remember, Remember the 5th of November, The Gunpowder, Treason, and Plot, there's several version of it, versions of it. One of the versions is the gunpowder treason plot. I'll give you a reason why Jesuit treason never should be forgotten. Wow. And that's just part of the history. It's, it's history that they don't teach in our schools. It used to be very, very commonly known by Christian, Protestant, evangelicals. I mean, you had Sir Thomas Carlyle, who was one of the most famous historians of the 19th century. 
in 1850, he called that era the age of Jesuitism, literally. So it was, there were very, very common warnings that were given among Protestants, evangelicals. Um, we talked about the Marquis de Lafayette, who said that uh, if America should ever lose its liberty, it would be at the hand of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests. And, and he was close with Washington. Oh, yeah. Lafayette, who served with George Washington during the Revolution. Absolutely. And, and, and go, go, so as we're progressing here a little bit, you know, we can't get into all of it, but e even talk, talk about the letters, which I thought was amazing, between Jefferson and, and, and was it Madison, I think? or John Adams. John Adams. John yeah. Adams, yeah. No, Adams, uh, the, the Jesuits, they had, they had been kicked out of the countries of Europe some 39 times by the year 1773. So just, so let's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so just, just in a couple hundred years or less, yeah. they, from they, 1540 to 1773. Yeah. So a couple hundred years that they had developed a reputation such that they were kicked out, uh, that this, this supposedly religious organization under the under the Catholic Church, this order, which was, um, you know, basically a tool of the Pope, correct? Well, they were they were called the Pope's men. Okay. And they were they were the reason that they were being driven out, and most of the countries that were driving them out were Catholic countries. Even Catholic countries were Even driving Catholic them out. Even Catholic countries were See, driving that, them out. That's important because. You say, "Oh, you're just a Protestant hater. You know, you you hate on the Catholics. You know, but here you're saying, no, no, no." Uh, the Catholic countries, and, and well, even later, I have here in your notes that the Pope Clement banished the Jesuits in 1773. So exactly. So it's not just this is a subversive group that has been on the tails or using Catholicism in many ways uh, for their agenda. Yeah. In, in fact, even in recent news here in the past few months, you had uh, Archbishop uh, Vigano, mm -hmm. who's gotten a lot of attention. Mel Gibson has endorsed uh, Vigano. But he blames the Jesuits right now for the corruption going on in the Vatican. The fact that they're promoting LGBT, they're, Francis is promoting atheism, he's promoting ecumenicalism. Saying, ecumenicalism, all religions lead somehow or other to God. And so Vigano knows, and many Catholics know, that what they did with Vatican Council II, because that was a Jesuit document, what they did with that was they literally changed everything that the Catholic Church and virtually any Christian church had taught for nearly 2,000 years. The very con the conservative theology. Yeah. They turned it upside down. Yeah. The one thing we used to believe as uh, Protestants, Catholics, and Greek and Russian Orthodox, we all used to agree that Christianity is the only true religion. Yeah. And there are many statements to that effect. You go read early court rulings in America, like uh, People versus John Ruggles. The, the court openly said that America, the United States, is a Christian society, right? And so they forbade blasphemy and contempt publicly against Christianity. And they said, neither are we obligated to grant the same protection to the religion of Muhammad or Buddhism, et cetera because we're a Christian society and our religion is based on Christianity or our laws are based on Christianity and not on the religion of those imposters. You see what I'm saying? So the courts in our country declared that pagan religions are false religions. Officially. Officially. That was the view of the United States when our country was founded all the way through the 19th century uh, and into the early part of the 20th century. It was Vatican II. I mean, they had the, uh, the Parliament of World Religions in the late 19th century at the Chicago World's Fair. Yeah, 1893. 1893. But there were no official church declarations, from what I understand, from that. I don't think there were. But nothing like Vatican Council II. Vatican, Is that, and that happened in the 60s, correct? Vatican II? Happened in the 1960s, yeah. And so now you have an official declaration from the Roman Catholic Church, from the Pope, the Cardinals, the bishops, and everything, basically declaring that Christianity and Catholicism are basically just as good or, or, or different paths to God. One of the many ways. Exactly. One of many ways to God. Which is so contrary, again, to... 
the previous catechisms going back because uh, even in the time of the Counter Reformation, I mean, they were they were you know declaring all their anathemas against mm-hmm. the, the the solas you know of, of the Reformation you know by grace by faith you know the Bible alone etc. And they were promoting you know the sacramental system uh, as the only way. Mm-hmm. And, and so to, to to see this in Vatican II to go contrary to what has been there that that's a big that's a big step for sure. And so this was originating or this was part of the Jesuit platform. Oh, yeah. In fact, the Jesuit general at the time was Pedro Arupe, who's really one of the most nefarious of the Jesuit generals, although he's always pictured smiling, you know, big, smiley, happy guy, very friendly guy. Uh, But Pedro Arupe, he ushered in a number of things. He ushered in the LGBT movement in the Catholic Church. Uh, He commissioned a guy, a Jesuit named John McNeil, to launch that whole movement, to write the book, The Church and the Homosexual, that if you want to understand why LGBT is infiltrated, heavily infiltrated Catholic churches and other denominations, that's where I would tell somebody to look. But Arupe was behind Vatican Council too. So much so that they call him the second founder of the Jesuit order. Wow. Because he so dramatically changed everything that the Jesuits and the Vatican and the whole Catholic Church had ever taught, you know, throughout their history. That's why they call him the second founder. And it's why so many Catholics like Mel Gibson and others reject Vatican Council too. They they see it as a betrayal of... Historic theology, yeah. Absolutely. You know, the the other thing that you, I mean, the documentary, again, is is almost three hours of just, you know, uh, I would say goodness of exposing what's happening there. Um, you, in the film, there's two things I would love to discuss in our remaining time is, is number one, I'd like to discuss how historically they were involved with Lincoln's assassination. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, the ways in which you spent some time there in the film about how the Jesuits were involved within World War II and Nazism. So uh, I, we can only do that in a few minutes, but uh, right. you know, talk talk about Lincoln for a minute because uh, the typical view is, well, Lincoln was trying to fight slavery and it was just against the South and, and that was it. But that's not necessarily, the, you bring up other historical elements of how the Catholic Church was absolutely involved in supporting the South against the North with the desire to break up or, or, or to cause weakness in the Union, and, and really to break it up, right? I mean, Right. Yeah, it's not that the Confederacy was a Catholic movement. I wouldn't say that. But there were many Catholics that were, that were involved, and politically, the Vatican supported the Southern Confederacy. So the Pope was the only world leader that wrote a letter of acknowledgement of Jefferson Davis as the president of the new... You know, separate, separate country. Basically. Exactly. Uh-huh. Basically a separate country. And that was a big deal, a very, very big deal. But it was known that the Vatican was supporting the Confederacy. You had people like Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis had been educated by Dominican priests. Uh, He had advisors who were Catholic priests. The uh, uh, first chaplain of the Confederacy was a Jesuit. Uh, He had people like uh, uh, John Bannon, a Confederate priest, and uh, then the Archbishop of New York, uh, who kind had, of double agent? It seems like yeah, he was a, a double agent. They called him uh, Dagger John, John Hughes, Archbishop Hughes, and uh, he was called Dagger John because he was a very tough guy. But he seemed to outwardly support Lincoln because he was based From in New there, York. Right? Uh-huh. Yeah, he's in the North. But it was said by Chinake and others that he secretly was supporting the Confederacy, politically. And it's the politics that, you know, uh, that matter. That's where the Vatican was uh, supporting the Confederacy because they were hoping to break up the Union entirely and establish what they called a Roman Catholic Empire from Mexico through America all the way up into Canada. That was the plan, according to Chinake and then a... uh, Union general named uh, General Thomas Maley Harris. He sat on the committee to investigate the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and came to the conclusion that the Vatican and the Jesuits were the ones who had trained John Wilkes Booth and the other conspirators to kill Lincoln. 
And he wrote a book years later called Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln. I mean, all of this is documented. It's been brushed under the carpet for some reason. Obviously, there are certain people who don't want us to know about this. But, um, but the evidence was so overwhelming that the United States government, after the Civil War, broke off diplomatic relations with the Vatican for more than 100 years. So, I mean, just, just say that again. I mean, say that again, really, people, <laughs> that this isn't, this isn't conspiracy. Oh, wow. The, 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 the government, the United yeah. States government. Yeah, the United States government. Because the evidence that came out in court, and General Harris talks about this, because he sat there, he watched the, the witnesses come in, he saw all the evidence firsthand, and he's documenting it in his book. And he said there, there's just no question that this was a Vatican plot involving the Jesuits who were at Georgetown College, which became Georgetown University, mm -hmm. which is their headquarters here in the United States, uh, that this was a Romish plot to kill Lincoln, mainly because they were angry that Lincoln, one, because he opposed the Confederacy, but also because he refused to acknowledge this European emperor that they had set up down in Mexico. And this is a whole chapter of the Civil War most people don't know about, where there was what was called the European plot. Uh, there was the Monroe Doctrine. President James Monroe said to the European countries, don't try to colonize North America. Just stay out of North America. Because we had had all these conflicts with the French, with the British, with Spain. You see what I'm saying? Over and over again. So they said, okay, we're, we're, we're a separate country now. This is the United States. Don't try to colonize here. Well, you had a plot involving Pope Pius IX, the Emperor Napoleon III of France, and then Maximilian I of Austria. So these three Catholic powers worked together to invade Mexico with a French army. 1862. 1862. Mm -hmm. And they invaded Mexico. And the idea was they were going to take control of Mexico and then go up and invade the southern United States and help the Confederacy defeat Lincoln, not because they were pro-Confederacy, but because they wanted to break up the Union. Mm -hmm. And so this is why Lincoln was fighting so hard to preserve the Union. And they talk about that today, that he preserved the Union, but the full historic context is not given, that there were these powers in Europe that wanted to establish this, what, and I'm quoting General Harris now, literally, he says they wanted to establish a Roman Catholic empire from Mexico through Texas, California, all the way up to Canada. Basically the West. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so what Chinake says, and, uh, and we talked about this earlier, what Chinake says... Who's Chinake for people oh, who don't know? Charles Chinake was a Canadian Catholic priest who was the good friend of Abraham Lincoln. He had actually migrated into America with a congregation from Canada. He was the founder of St. Anne, Illinois, and he was actually a, a nationally recognized figure. He was well known. When he died, his obituary appeared on the front page of the New York Times. Yeah, amazing. So this guy of stature, for sure. He, he, was, yeah, he, and he was Catholic. He was Catholic. He did convert and become Protestant later on. But he was the good friend of Abraham Lincoln. He had gotten into a conflict with the church leaders in the Catholic Church, and they dragged him into court through an agent of theirs named Peter Spink, and were accusing Chinake of different things. Well, long story short, Abraham Lincoln was a lawyer at that time, and he defended Chinake in court, and won the case, and, and had the charges thrown out, and basically rescued uh, Chinake from almost certain ruin. And so that's how they met each other and how they became friends. But this is years before Lincoln became president. So Chinake was a famous priest because... In Canada, he had opposed alcoholism and stuff like that. And so everybody thought he was this very virtuous man. He was well-liked, well-loved by his congregation. But he encountered the corruption from Rome and believed that the hierarchy was angry at Lincoln for defending him. And he even warned Lincoln because he said he saw Jesuits in the courtroom uh, when the trial happened and uh, when the hierarchy was defeated... He said he saw a look on the face of the Jesuits that they were eventually going to kill Lincoln. That's what he believed. Mm -hmm. But of course, it didn't happen until years later when the Civil War happens. 
Um, and so Chinake wrote two books. He wrote a book called 50 Years in the Church of Rome, where he describes his own journey, you know, as, as a Catholic priest and all the experiences that he had and, and then his relationship with Abraham Lincoln uh, and how he, he became the friend of Lincoln. But he met him repeatedly in the White House and warned him because he believed that the Jesuits were planning and plotting to kill him. Now, some people would think and have tried to argue that Chinake's claims were exaggerated or maybe he, you know, shouldn't be trusted, this kind of thing. Later historians after World War II made those kind of claims. The problem is when you get to General Harris's book, who, who was a union general, he was a doctor, he sat on the court, he actually confirmed most everything that Chinake had to say. And so uh, their, their views of things, you know, uh, work together and, you know, one confirms the witness of the other. Mm -hmm. But then when you have the book in the 20th century by uh, Emmett McLaughlin, which was called An Inquiry into the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln. McLaughlin was a Catholic priest, and he kept hearing these stories. This is happening in the 1960s. And McLaughlin kept hearing these stories about the assassination of Lincoln. And he said, could there be anything to this? So he started investigating, started going through the record, church records and so on. And he said he was just amazed at how much information he uncovered. Now, I think one of the most fascinating parts of his book because he, he has a lot of information there. There's no way we could go over all of it. But he presents a lot of documentation. But he says to the American people, he says, you can't really understand the Civil War unless you understand what was happening south of the border. And so he has a chapter in his book called Conspiracy South of the Border. And I believe that conspiracy continues to this day. And that that's really what's going on in Mexico today with this mass immigration uh, into our country because Chinake said in his writings that the Catholic bishops, this is after the Civil War, after Lincoln was assassinated, he said that the Catholic bishops had a meeting and he basically revealed that Plan A had been trying to invade America with this French army. Just the, the direct, kind of yeah, the direct way. The, the direct way, mm -hmm. force of arms, etc. That didn't work, that failed. So now plan B, according to the Catholic bishops, would be to flood our country through Mexico with immigrants, mass immigration into the country, get the immigrants into the major cities, and then use that to eventually get control of the United States. And so, um, so here we have, you know, that beginning post-Civil War and mm -hmm. continuing, and then here we are in the last few years having it completely unleashed. Right. In fact, there's even a document that we talk about uh, that Steve Matthews from the Trinity Foundation, he had first brought this to my attention, that the Catholic bishops of America sat down with the Catholic bishops of Mexico, and they came up with a document called Strangers No Longer Together on a Journey of Hope. And it's basically a plan where they agreed between themselves to mass immigrate all these as many as they can as many as they can through the mexican border and for the most part you know we've had a um we've had a, a, a you know i would say if my impression is in comparison to what's currently happening in the past you know let's say the 40s 50s 60s we had a we had a good border right we had a, we had uh security oh yeah i i think there there are border conflicts that go all the way back to the early 20th century and they get kind of confusing but we used to defend our southern border, you know, in a very uh, dogmatic way. We didn't allow it to be violated, uh, and we were a lot tougher about it. But through, I think, after the Reagan administration, because the Reagan administration is what reopened diplomatic relations with the Vatican. Mm. That happened during the Reagan administration. And I can only imagine it was well-intended. I can't imagine yeah. Ronald Reagan meant anything bad by it. But I just think he did not know about this plot that went back at that point about 100 years to eventually flood our country with all these uh, immigrants. And that Rome is still following that plot. They've never yeah. given it up. 
And all the evidence is there. And the, the current Pope, I mean, he's pushing, he is, it's interesting and surprising. I, and, and until watching your documentary, I never put it together. I was like, why is this Pope so interested in the Southern border? And he's making comments about this, our Southern border mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. It, I believe it's a 120, 140 year old plan that they've had. They've not always been in a position to carry it out. But as, but if you look at people like Joe Biden, Joe Biden, Jesuit educated, mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi, she worked with John Boehner to put the first Jesuit priest in as chaplain of the house. Um, AOC, she, she used to write for the Jesuits America magazine. You have a Mayorkas is Jesuit educated. All, you have this whole Jesuit collection of people in the Democratic Party mainly who are part of this coalition to open our borders and just flood the country with all of these immigrants. It's, it's, it's absolutely astounding. And, um, you know, we're, we're out of time here, but, uh, in, in thinking about your, again, this latest documentary, um, we, we didn't get a chance to go into it, but you, you talk about, um, world war two, you talk about Georgetown, you talk about the CIA, you talk about all, all these other things that are happening in our current culture, Bill Clinton, and how it all comes back to, you know, where are most of the spies from? Well, they're all Georgetown educated, Georgetown. which is, yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, kind of give us a wrap up here at, uh, at again, the goal of, of this of this documentary that, um, again, well done, and what you want people to get. Well, if I can just say something about Nazi Germany and that whole thing, there was a, uh, a priest, Catholic priest named Leo Lehman, who became a Protestant. He wrote a book called Behind the Dictators during the war, during World War II. A lot of books on this, and you know we quote him in the film. But he in particular said, and the evidence is there, that the entire Nazi movement was set up by the Jesuit order to carry out their purposes. To carry out their purposes. The Holocaust, all the horrors of World War II were to carry out their agenda. And what happened was Germany, which had been really dominated by a Protestant and freedom-based worldview through the 19th century with Otto von Bismarck, the country was basically hijacked mm. by the Jesuit order using National Socialism they're the ones who developed socialism with Karl Marx. We go over that in the film. And they hijacked that country and then used it for evil purposes. Part of what I'm hoping an audience will recognize in watching American Jesuits is that the same thing is happening right here in the United States. That these dark powers in Washington are being driven by the same people who were responsible for the Inquisition who were responsible for the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, mm -hmm. responsible for a, a, a number of atrocities that are well known. And they are seizing control of our national government. And I believe they want to use our country for diabolical purposes. I think we as God-fearing Christian men and women have a responsibility to resist them. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Mm -hmm. And I believe we've got to do all that we can, lift up a shout, preach the word of God, inform people, and hopefully we can prevent catastrophe from happening to our country as it happened to Germany during the war. Amen. Yeah, I mean, th th these are the stakes. We know where it's heading uh, as it relates to globalism and the weakness of America, which stands in the way of that currently. And, and America is becoming very weak. We see it uh, all around us. And so the goal is to stay, stay strong. Well, Chris, thank you for your time today. It's been awesome. If you want to pick up his new documentary, prophecywatchers.com, check it out. And, and we have a lot of uh, your material on there. And again, you will... You will be amazed at your, your research. So thanks, everybody, for listening this week. Uh, again, the Week in Bible Prophecy, trying to keep you up to date on what's happening in our world. So we'll catch you next time.